Today we're going to look at a special case of an integral known as Laplace's integral. And what's really cool about this is it's some sort of like integral representation of the reciprocal of the gamma function. Now we won't prove, prove this in its full generality, but we will show that it's like the reciprocal of the factorial, which is a good start. Okay, so let's see what we have. So Laplace's integral, or a special case, like I said, of Laplace's integral, we'll call L of s, and it's equal to one over two pi, and then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the one plus i t over one plus i t to the s power dt. And then what we'll show is that L evaluated at n plus one is one over n factorial, and that's for all non-negative integers. So there we have it. We've got like a reciprocal of a factorial built in to this really cool integral. Now, before we get started, I'd like to compare this with the gamma function, which is much more well known. So gamma of s is equal to the integral from zero to infinity, x to the s minus one, e to the minus x, dx. And then you can show that gamma evaluated at n plus one is n factorial. So see what we've got going on there? I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's get started. And the thing that we'll start with is building a recursion between ln plus one and ln. So let's do that. So let's start with L of n. And so just copying that over, that'll, that'll be one over two times pi. And then we've got this integral from minus infinity up to infinity of e to the one plus i times t over one plus i times t, all raised to the, let's see, n power dt. Okay, nice. And now we're going to do one step of integration by parts on this integral. And so we'll start our setup by letting u equal one over one plus i t raised to the n power. Now differentiating, that means du will be minus i times n, times dt over one plus i times t raised to the n plus one. So like I said, that's just from taking the derivative there. And then if that's our u object, then we need to find our dv object, which will be the rest of the stuff. So dv will be e to the one plus i times t dt. And then taking the antiderivative, we'll see that v is equal to one over i times e to the one plus i t. Okay, so there we have it. Now we can apply our integration by parts formula. So this should be u times v minus v du. Okay, so we have a one over two pi out front that we can't forget about. And then u times v will give us one over i. Then we have e to the one plus i t over one plus i t raised to the n power we're evaluating that as t goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. And then we've got minus the integral of v du. So let's see, this i here, we'll cancel this i, one's in the numerator and one's in the denominator. The minus sign built into integration by parts, we'll cancel this minus sign. And then finally, this n right here will factor out of the resulting integral. So that'll give us plus n times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the one plus i t over one plus i t raised to the n plus one dt. Okay, so like I said, that's simply from the integration by parts formula. Okay, so now let's see what's going on here. So t is approaching positive and negative infinity, but that's the imaginary part of this exponential approaching positive and negative infinity. But that's not gonna change anything. Notice that if we have e to the i times t, the modulus of that is one. And maybe we could see that a little bit more clearly if we separate this thing out into e times e to the i t. And like I said, the size of this thing is always equal to one because you could separate it out as cosine t plus i sine t 
And then clearly, if you take the complex absolute value or the modulus, you'll get one for that. So that's not making this thing larger or smaller. That being said, the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the imaginary direction, if you will. But since that's happening in the denominator, then the whole thing's going to zero, just as it would with real numbers. Okay, so now all of that said, this stuff will just cancel out to zero. And that leaves us with n over two times pi times this integral from minus infinity to infinity. Well, I'm just gonna bring that down. There's really not much to say about that. Except, notice what we're left with is exactly the n plus first integral. So we have L of n is equal to n times L of n plus one. But now you could rewrite that also as L of n plus one is equal to one over n times L of n. So that gives us a way of calculating maybe all values of L of n if we have one of them. Okay, and that's how we'll continue. So we just came up with the following formula, really, and its companion, which allows you to relate a value of L with maybe a value of L that's one away. And here it didn't really matter that N was a non-negative integer. This could have worked for any complex number, which up here, S can really be any complex number. Okay, so that being said, we're gonna restrict ourselves to the case when n is a non-negative integer for this video. Okay, so just to recall, we have L of n is n times L of n plus one, and likewise, L of n plus one is one over n times L of n. And now from here, we just need a single value. And that value that we'll calculate is L of two. And we're gonna calculate L of two probably because it's like the easiest one to calculate. Okay, so that's gonna give us one over two times pi. And then we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the one plus i times t over one plus i times t squared dt. Okay, but instead of calculating this directly, we're going to push this from the real axis to the complex plane and use some complex analysis. Okay, so let's draw a bit of a picture here. And maybe we'll fit this picture kind of in the bottom spot right here. Okay, so I'm gonna put my complex plane. I really only need the upper half plane for what we're doing. And then some important points along this will be minus r back here, positive r back here, and then maybe i times r here. And now we're gonna have the semicircle through those three points. So it's like the semicircle with radius r. And then I'm also gonna complete this. Great. And then I'll orient it counterclockwise, which is like kind of standard. Okay, great. So what are we gonna do from here? So from here, we're gonna notice that this integrand has a pole at t equals i. So that gives us, well, we can draw it in here right here. In fact, it's a second order pole. You can see that because we've got a square in the denominator right there. And then furthermore, let's go ahead and name some of these parts. So let's name this maybe semicircle gamma sub r. That's kind of a standard name for semicircle when you're doing this. And then we'll just note that this bit right here is the interval from minus r to plus r. So let's write the integral around this boundary. So we've got one over two pi. I'm just including that because it is a part of this function up here. And then we'll have the integral over gamma sub r union minus r to r, that interval. So that's gonna complete this whole picture here. And then we've got our function. So e to the one plus i t over one plus i t squared dt. Okay, nice. And now by complex analysis, this integral will be two pi i times the sum of the residues of all of the poles within this region. But there's a single pole within this region. So it'll simply be two pi i times the residue at i. So notice that two pi i will cancel this two pi down to just i. So that's pretty cool. 
So we'll have i times the residue of our function e to the 1 plus i t over 1 plus i t at i. So there we've got it. So next up, I'm gonna split this into two pieces. So my first piece will be one over two pi and then this integral over the interval. So there we've got it, one over two pi and then the integral from minus r to r of e to the one plus i t over one plus i t squared dt. And then I'll have one over two pi and then the integral over the semicircle, which recall we called that gamma sub r. So we have e to the one plus i t over one plus i t quantity squared dt. Okay, so there we have that. And now we'll note that if we take this first integral and take the limit as r goes to infinity, we simply get our L sub two back. So that'll trend towards L sub two. Then we just need to figure out what's going on over here as R goes to infinity. Okay, so let's maybe do that up here. And this is gonna require an argument involving really size of these functions. Okay, nice. So let's go here. So we've got the modulus of the integral of gamma sub r of e to the one plus i t over one plus i t quantity squared dt will be less than or equal to the integral over gamma r of, well, the modulus of the numerator. But the modulus of the numerator is bound above by the number e. And we can see that because the real part of this exponent is always less than or equal to one, given that we've got a positive imaginary part for t giving us like one minus something. Okay, so like I said, the modulus of the numerator is bound above by one. And then the modulus of the denominator will be bound above by r squared, you know, for kind of similar reasons. And then the modulus of the denominator will be bound above by r squared. I think that's even more clear. So there we've got r squared. Then we have dt. So we're essentially integrating a constant over this semicircle. But that means the result will be the, well, the arc length of this semicircle times that constant. But the arc length of this semicircle will simply be pi times r. So here we have this is equal to pi times e over r, given that the r will cancel the r squared down just to a simple r. So now as r goes to infinity here, this thing clearly goes to zero. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, as r goes to infinity, this whole thing will go to L of two. But notice everything on the left-hand side is simply i times this residue. So that means this L sub two is simply I times this residue. So we might as well replace the integral with that. So like I said, L of two is I times the residue of E to the one plus I T over one plus I T quantity squared. Well, I left that off here, but I think that's okay. Fixed it now at I. So now that's all we have to do is calculate that residue and then we'll have one value from which we can bootstrap to get all of the other values. Okay, so now let's calculate that residue. Okay, so now we're ready to finish this thing off. So using a result about how to calculate, well, residues at second order poles, we can rewrite this as i times the limit as t goes to i of the derivative with respect to t of t minus i quantity squared times e to the one plus i t all over one plus i times t quantity squared. So this derivative comes from the fact that we've got a second order pole and also this t minus i in the numerator, which is squared, comes from the fact that we have a second order pole at i. Okay, so now let's see if we can simplify that. Well, we can pull an i out of this denominator right here. And in fact, if we pull an i out of this denominator, that'll turn into a minus one because it'll become an i squared. And also it'll change this denominator 
to t minus i. Okay, so anyway, that's just a bit of factoring. But now this t minus i squared term will cancel with this t minus i squared term. And then this minus one can be brought out to a minus i. And then we have the limit as t approaches i of the derivative with respect to t of e to the one plus i t. So that'll be i times e to the one plus i times t. Okay, but now this minus i and this i will multiply together to give us the number one, and then we'll be left with, well, one times e to the one plus i squared, which is what we get from plugging t equals i in there, but e to the one plus i squared is clearly e to the zero, which is one. So what, what do we have? We have L of two equals one. But from there, we can really fill in all of the gaps. So notice that L of one will be one times L of one plus one, but that's just L of two. So L of one is also one. So let's maybe keep a list over here. So we ha have L of one is one. We have L of two is one. And now we can use this rule right here. So L of three is the same thing as L of two plus one, which by this rule right here is one over two times L of two, which is one half. So there we've got L of three is equal to one half. And now we can really just keep going. So notice L of four will be equal to L of three plus one. So that'll be one over three times L of three. That'll be one over three times two. So there we've got L of four is one over three factorial because three times two is three factorial. And now you can see where the pattern is coming up. Now, I guess technically you would need to prove by induction from here, but I think that we've set it up pretty nicely that you can do that on your own if you'd like. And that's a good place to see. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.